Hello, thanks for coming back. My stitch week didn't have a lot of stitching in it, I have to admit. I was very busy with uh, grab and go kits and I had to do all the marketing, all the packaging, uh, all the cutting, all the prepping for my new release in this series called The Grove. So behind me you'll see I have winter, fall, and now we have summer or spring. Depends on how you look at it. We only have three seasons in New England. <laughs> so isn't that sweet? So that's the third in this series and that will start shipping on June 1st. So look for your email. There'll be a promotional email for free shipping um, if you pre-order before the ship date. So um, I did all that. I had to do all that cutting and, and all the prepping but you know I, it's, it's just a different kind of joy. So I might not have been stitching, but I still get very excited when I release a new product because I love it so much. I can't wait for everybody to see it and see if they love it too. So um, that, that's one thing I was doing this week. And the other was getting ready for Stitching Joy. So our next shipment is about to go out. It's the second in the series of six and it's called Freedom. So it's very patriotic themed. So I will have to shoot the video, uh, instructional video for that next week. Um, so I don't foresee any big stitching in that area, but that's okay. Um, so I figure I'll tell you a few things that I have been up to when it relates to stitching. So I did the grab and go kit, I did the um, stitching joy kits, got everything ready for shipping. And you know, with the grandkids around, there's not always like a lot of downtime. Uh, but luckily I have my iPhone and I have Pinterest. <laughs> what, the, what more does girl need? Um, and I was looking for, I was looking for those little like pouch um, bags that you can hang like on a peg. Um, and I found a pattern instead of the finished product. And so of course I, I ordered the pattern. And I just want to show it to you because, you know, I think it's important to support our local shops. But, you know, the world's changing and there's other people that need our support too. And they're people like me. You know, I sit home in my little basement and I produce my product. I put a lot of heart into it. And, you know, so do all these other uh, ladies mostly. Gentlemen, of course. But, you know, it's the industry itself. We used to say support your local shop, support your local shop, support your local shop. But you know, our local shops mostly have an online presence. And so when you are online and you are supporting a shop that is online, you're really supporting that local shop as well. So I think we have to change the way we think about that. You know, there there is a lot of um, interest in supporting women in business and small business owners uh, not just women, of course, but it, it's different now. So, all with all that, uh, so I got this from an Etsy shop, and you know, the new thing also is downloadables, so you get a PDF file that you have to print out, and so this one is called Bubble Pods, but that's really about what I was looking for, those little pouches, I know they have them like at Ikea and all that, but I can stitch it, so why not? So my plan is to make four, and I'll show you. I'm going to use this little peg rack, right? And so I'll put that up on the wall where I do my stitching or maybe over my cutting uh, station. Um, and in those little pouches, I'll just put all the stuff that you need when you're ironing or cutting. So that's a project that I hope to start um, at Socation in June. Of course, I have a lot of plans for June's location, and I have to remember, it's only three days. Although, we have two very, very long days. Um, my pal and I are known to be the midnight quilters. So we stay up very late, because we're at location. So we're gonna get as much done as we can. Okay, so that's, that's my little, um, telling you what I'm gonna do with that. And then, um, you know, there's this little problem I'm starting to, to form. <laughs> I'm going to admit it. 
I get drawn into these block of the months now and I signed up for one that I told you about last time and that one is called Dancing Chickens and Flying Pigs. Cute, right? And my friend in Ohio didn't want to make that one so my friend over here in Massachusetts is going to do that one with me and I'm doing another one with a friend in Ohio from the same designer and that one's called The Santa, The Tree, The Turkey and Me. Such cute names. And it's an Australian designer that does um, these really cute patterns. Um, I noticed that that Santa one uh, was block of the month, current block of the month with Lisa Bonjean from Primitive, Primitive Gatherings. I was going to say Primitive Stitching. Uh, Primitive Gatherings. And I was like, oh, I missed the boat on that one, but that's okay because, you know, I'm going to do it with my buddy. Now, of course, if you know my friend, she's finished. I'm not finished with my first block, but I'll show you some of my progress because, you know, there's no pressure. Honestly, I don't feel pressured. I just, I'm, I'm retired. I'm going to stitch all I can. And so here is my progress. I don't think I showed you. So that's why I wanted to, to put that little ta-da up there. Uh, so I'm working on that. Now, you know, this is, um, number three in the series of I think six or seven videos and the reason I'm doing these videos is it's kind of lonely <laughs> I mean I enjoy my alone time when the kids go to school and I know they're happy so it's okay for me to be happy um, but you know there's very few people to talk to especially um, stitchers and so I just really love that you join me and in return I hope to offer you some inspiration and some instruction so last time I showed you how I did my hand piecing um, you may never do it and that's okay but um, I, I just want to offer you something in return for your company um, so today this week um, for this video I thought I would show you how to do some English paper piecing. You've probably seen it a million times over and over again, but I thought I'll share with you a couple of my little techniques that I like. And, um, you know, part of what I do is I watch YouTube a lot and, um, I'll watch a video on how to do English paper piecing by many people because they're going to show me a tool, they're going to show me a technique, they're going to show me their approach, and I really enjoy it because I want to get some knowledge out of it. And so I want to offer that back to you as well. So, so I'm here to confess about my blog of the month. I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to go call it like, um, it's not really an addiction because I don't want help for it. Uh, it's my latest joy I guess you could say and so I got my first shipment of dancing chickens and flying pigs so I'll show you that and you know the, the really sweet thing is these block of the months come in a cute little box so let me show you that I got them all stacked up over here waiting to go look so pretty so this is from and I know that the wording is not backwards, <laughs> like I said once before, because I'm starting to learn about cameras, and this is not a, a mirrored system, so this is digital, so I know you can read it. I'm getting so smart now. So let me show you what came in my box. First of all, they got pretty tissue paper. And this comes from a place called Red Barn Ranch, and it is in Wolfram, Texas. I love Texans. They're, they're happy people. Southern people, they're very happy. We're all uptight up here. I don't know. So anyway, get a little postcard. Welcome to the, I think they call us stitch stars. Oh, block stars. See that? Block stars. And so in my first month's shipment, I got part one of the pattern. So there's that cutie right there. Now, you know me, I like brights, but I also like variety. And I like to try new things. So I want to try to make something uh, quilt or wall hanging that somebody else selected the colors. And I really, I really wanted to switch out a couple of these already. I'm going to not do that. I'm not going to do that. I 
want to, but I'm not going to. So now that I said it out loud, I have to do it. So whatever. So anyway, so I got my first um, part one. And of course, you know, after you sign up for the um, lock of the month or whatever series project you're going to do with them, there's always add-on sales. Yes, please. And so it's another opportunity for me to try a product that I haven't used before. And they offered us this cute little packet of thread. And it's, it's just, they do so much cute little marketing. I love it. And so this is called My Soul is Fed by Needle and Thread. They put a little flying piggy on it. Adorable. And But inside are all these luscious threads that are used for this project. And they are um, Wonder Fill Elana Wool Thread. I do believe it's oh, 28 oh there it is it's 28 weight two ply wool thread and it has a nice chunkiness to it I'm used to doing my applique with DMC floss I use three strands of floss sometimes two um, so I am looking forward to using a new a new product that's gonna be fun so I have all my colors and that's the other reason I can't switch out my wool because then I would have to switch out my thread and that's just not going to happen. I'm going to follow the rules. I'm going to do it. I'm going to. I'm going to do it. So I also got in my box, what's that hiding over there? Oh, that's nothing. The background fabric, and this is a Kona solid. Um, I can't remember the name of the color, but it's just this really, not really dark tan, not really light tan, just like the perfect tan perfect color like a linen-y pretty and then I got I got all these little bits of wool that I have to decipher into what part it goes to little squares little little bits and who doesn't like getting presents I love getting presents and so look a little packet of seeds Texas blue bonnet flowers so I think we'll um, put these in the dirt this weekend. Keep the kids busy, right? So that is um, my first, my first ever shipment block of the month. But wait, there's more. <laughs> Isn't that what they say? Okay, so I got that one, and I'm excited about getting it started. Now I have to tell you, it came. Um, I think almost a week ago and do you know how hard it is to just like leave the box and do all your other stuff that you have to do I mean stuff you want to do but still the the restrain I had to restrain myself from digging in and I think I said I was gonna start on Monday but I'm pretty sure we're gonna see something going on on Sunday because why not Sunday is stitch day so that's, that's my block of the month for that. So I, I, I know I also mentioned to you that I love Sue Spargo. I love how she does all her designs and stuff with, um, with the, she just, she's like super. Just check her out because you'll know the style when you see it. But um, I'm on her newsletter mailing list. So that's my connection to the outside world. You know, I, I'm, I'm here, we're kind of isolated. Not just because of the pandemic. For me, it's new that I'm home all the time. I'm retired. I'm home all the time. I do really like it. But I do miss people. I miss them a lot. I get to see people at Socation. You know, here and there, you know, you see a friend or two. But it's not the same as when I had the shop. So when I had the shop, I had visitors all the time, every day. Somebody to chat with. Somebody to hear about new um stitching things that they're doing and I get to show what I'm doing well you get the point it's just kind of lonely when you're at home so uh, I get a lot of newsletters and see what's happening out there and um, Sue Spargo sent an email out and they're promoting um, their block of the month and it's uh, English paper piecing I love English paper piecing I'm, I'm a quilter and that's my first thing that I do is quilting for sure 
If I were to say how I identify, I identify as a quilter. The second thing I identify as, in the crafting world obviously, is um, an applique person. I love to applique. And English paper piecing sounds like, you know, what you think with paper piecing, people automatically think, oh, when you stitch on the lines on the paper, you got to pull the paper off the back. It's different. So it's all those little cardboard shapes. You wrap the fabric around it and, you know, you've seen it. You've seen the hexes for years now. You probably have some started. You know you do. Don't fib. And so I saw this advertisement. It just pops up on the screen. And it was for a Halloween machine applique um, quilt. So cute. And it is from Stitches of Love, which is um, the advertiser that popped up on Instagram. And the quilt is called Boo Crew. You know, boo, scary. And they offer two different um, block of the month programs. One is machine applique on your sewing machine. And the other one is machine embroidered applique. So if you have, a, you know, one of those embroidery machines uh, where, you're, you know, the block is done in the hoop, blah, blah, blah. So, of course, I, I don't want that one. I like to, I don't, well, I have an old embroidery machine. It's not my thing. So I signed up for the one um, that's done by a regular sewing machine that I'll be doing raw edge fusible applique. And so every month I'm going to get another little package. It's going to have the fabric in it for the background. And then it's going to have laser cut pre-fused fabric for the quilt. Yay. I just love the whole idea of that. So I'll be doing that. So now we're up to three, three block of the month programs. And I'm also doing, of course, um, Color Blocks Quilt Along 2021 with Debbie Brown. Her quilt for May is so cute. It's, it's just so sweet. It just, I don't know, you have to look on her site, look on her website. You know, it's a free sew along. Uh, every month you get a free pattern to use your color blocks. I've told you all about it before, so you get it. Uh, it's a really cute one. So I finished my April quilt on May 1st. So I'm falling a little bit behind. Um, and then this quilt now from that came out for May 1st, I honestly don't see me getting it done in May. I mean, I have to confess. If we don't take a trip to New Jersey to see the grandkids and the kids in Jersey, I might have some time to sew. Um, but it's not looking looking like it'll be done. But you know what? That's okay. There is no pressure. When you sign up for these things, there's no pressure. And you want to know what? They come in a cute little box for a reason. You know these block of the months that come in cute little boxes? So you can stack them. You can stack them in a pile. And then you pick them off when you're ready. And if you don't get it done each month, there's no quilt police. I'm just saying. Anyway. Um, well, it's not a block of the month, but another thing I signed up for, <laughs> I told you this is the confessions section of the video. I signed up for um, another program through the Fat Quarter Shop. You might have heard of them, Fat Quarter Shop. Uh, and it is, of all things, cross-stitch. I'm not going to be a cross-stitcher, you know, in my bones. But there's such cute stuff out there. And I'm really kind of wanting to kind of decorate my sewing room with cute little things like that. And I love sampler quilts, and I kind of love sampler um, cross-stitch. The only problem is they're usually really big, but but just I just like it, and I just want um, warm, fun sewing type stuff for my sewing room. Who who doesn't? Uh, so I'm signed up for um, that one. It is a Lori Holt um, cross stitch. If you don't know who Lori Holt is, you got to get with the program. Just Google her. Go on YouTube. She's a fun lady. Um, 
she just does a lot of great stuff and I have lots of other projects <laughs> in the project bag for Lori Holt but so this is a quarterly and I double checked when it started because I couldn't remember I signed up I think two months ago and so my first quarter and it was like right after that one started so I just missed the shipment on that one so I have a couple of months before it shows up and so it will be coming in June and they're tiny little I'll show you when I get it they're just tiny little stitch cards also called a pattern and they're full color and you you know you open them up and you follow the colors and they're just little little bitty ones very doable I should be able to accomplish them while I'm outside with the kids and they're riding their bikes and I'm um, doing my little hand stitching because that's what I can do when I'm watching the kids and summer break is only seven weeks away I do enjoy it when it, I enjoy staying with the kids in the summer but I also enjoy you know downtime variety so anyway what comes with that one is I get the full color stitch card I get the floss because somebody else picks out the colors I get the fabric so that's kind of cool and then I get um, a needle I get a notion I don't know what the notion's going to be and then I also get bonus goodies I don't know the word goodies are in there it's got to be good not all goodies are edible so uh, I won't get any, gain any calories on that one I'm just really looking forward to it um, now as a stitch um, when you're in this little stitch quarterly uh, you can purchase the backlog but I'm thinking just go forward just, just go forward there's a lot of cute stitch cards. I don't have to go back. I can just keep going. So that's what I'm going to do. And so um, the other thing I signed up for is not a block of the month. But it's fun. Oh, wait. I wanted to show you my progress on my cross stitch. Okay. So this is one that I'm doing for my sewing room. And here is what I have done so far. Oopsie. See? She believes she could. And then the bottom letters will be so, S-E-W, she did. And that is just going to be so cute. And here is this. Here's the pattern. Now, isn't that adorable? Don't you want that in your sewing room? So this is a Lori Holt design, and you can get this through the Fat Quarter Shop. So that's my progress on that. And while I was stitching, I was a little bit cranky um, because it's different. It's not quilting. You know, quilting I can kind of do with my eyes closed. I can do any pattern, anything, whatever. But when you do something new, it's a little bit more challenging. And I do use my Thread Heaven to um, condition my floss it does tangle for some reason um, two strands seem to tangle more than three strands I don't know why maybe it's just me maybe it's just you know I, I really don't know <laughs> but anyway and so my my thread conditioner wasn't working so I got something new from back order shop from Lori Holt and it is 100% um, natural beeswax so um, beeswax you know made from bees and uh, if you can get it open you can use it but I just thought it was cute because it's called mind your own beeswax thread conditioner and then you know while I was there because what am I gonna do just buy beeswax of course not I gotta get all the tools for this cross stitch stuff so I got this ruler that they talk about and this is for I'm sure my friend that's going to help me in June, at June's location, I'm sure she'll tell me, but i got to have the tools. And so it's got something to do with how you can start on your fabric so that, you you know, your design fits. You don't want to get to the other side and realize your fabric's too short. And then these are little metal, um, so you can use them like a magnet. 
and they hold your place on the chart uh, so you don't have to, you know, everything is really tiny little X's. And so these are called Cross Stitch Line Keeper. So I'm getting all my tools, getting all my stuff. Okay, so that's that. So that kind of wraps up the cross stitch thing. Um, and so I was about to tell you about another program I signed up for because, you know, while you're watching YouTube, and I was watching, um, what's her name? Kimberly Jolly, who is the owner of the Fat Quarter Shop. You've probably have seen her if you're online. I like to do that. She's very bubbly. She has an incredible staff. She does, she, she just does it all. But she was doing a sewing room tour. And I love to, I love to watch those because you can see, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I should, you know, organize my floss like that. Or I sometimes look at it and say, yeah, no way. Uh, that takes too much time to organize it to that level. You know, but, uh, but whatever it is, you get to see other, the way other people do things and decide if you like it. But she was showing her um, sewing room and on one of her little shelves, she showed a pin cushion with her collectible pins from just another button company. So I'll put all these, um, you know how, you know how YouTube works? You put all those things in the description down below so you can click the link and you can go see it. So I'll do the same thing. I'm getting the hang of this YouTube thing. By the way, how did you like my opening? <laughs> so cute, right? So Easton helped me with that. He's the producer. So anyway, she told me, uh, told us, the people watching, about um, just another button company's program that they do where every month they send you pins. And here's their um, collection that just came out for May. And they're really cute. I mean, they're so pretty. And I like to make pin cushions with wool, my wool and my new thing is to be making smalls. That's what they call them, smalls. But small projects, small pin I do like to make a lot of pin cushions and I always seem to lose my pin, but. Um, and so these are really pretty little pins that um, I'm going to enjoy collecting. And this is just ongoing. This is like, it goes until it stops or you stop it. So that's super cool. But every month when you get your pins, you also get a pattern for a pincushion. And so this is a cute little one. And since I want to do these little smalls, I'm going to try to make the pincushions. But I have, you know, I have a ton of dies. As you know, I die cut all my kits. So these are all die cut kits. And so for me to sit there and trace out a pattern for a bird, a nest, and some leaves, I already have this stuff. And I'm just going to take inspiration from it and use die cut pieces and make the pin cushion. Um, and then you put the pin, oh, this is going to be so cute. So I'm looking forward to that. And uh, so that's that one. And um, I think so. that's all my confessions. <laughs> that's all my confessions for this um, this week. So this is my stitch week. Um, I wanted to share with you a tip, right? I mean, you know, it's all about the content. Who wants to sit there watching me babble, right? You want to get something out of it. That's another thing I notice when I'm watching videos on YouTube. I'm like, come on, get to the point. I want to know. Come on, hurry up. And so I'm trying to be quicker. And so anyway, I have, um, who doesn't have a bunch of notions? If you say you don't, you're not telling the truth. So I have all of these little, um, these wheels. Oh, I, for, you know, I forgot to have a close-up camera. Move that out of the way. These um, chalk wheels, right? And when, they, when you get them, they come with chalk and you use them for marking. But the problem is getting the chalk off of my fabric or my wool, whatever it's gonna be, Getting the chalk off, I mean, you can rub it and rub it and you're really just polishing it right into the fibers and so that really doesn't work. So here's my tip for you. You open up your wheel, and I think I'm probably gonna make a mess, but I'm gonna try and do this. So you open it up 
dump the fat, um, you open it, you dump out the chalk that came with it. It's only like a little bit, just get rid of it. Just get it out of your sight. Then you get this product from Supellin Designs. Uh, you know, I was certified Supellin Shop and I love her products. And this one is so, so helpful. And so this is Iron Off Chalk Powder. It is white only. And the reason I don't use any colors is because the, how they get the color into the chalk usually involves uh, pigment and wax, which kind of just sticks to the fibers. So there's no real guarantee it's going to come out, and that would make me very unhappy. And so I just pop this off, pop off the lid, and you just fill her up. Fill her up. You're supposed to actually fill this and then put it back. but. And so now, I what I did too is I... Um, Yesterday took the time to load all of my chalk wheels, even this yellow one. I dumped out the yellow and I put white in it, but I, I took all of my chalk wheels and I made sure they all had my iron away chalk powder. And so that's a tip for you. So go to suepellindesigns.com and order yourself a bottle. It's like $8. It's gonna look how much is in there. Is it going to last you a long, long time? And you will be much happier when you can iron away your chalk lines. And you know, even though it's white, I have used it on white fabric because it's just enough that you can see, you can see enough to do your placement. For me, it's for my wool applique placement. Um, I just love it. So that's your tip for this week is to use iron away chalk, empty your chalk wheels and fill them up. So today I wanted to show you some hands-on techniques for doing English paper piecing. So this technique is called, I don't really know what it's called, but I decided to call it a row by row approach. Um, a lady came by my store a long time ago and was telling me about how she does her really huge king size um, English paper piecing quilts by using um, a graph and then piecing her um, hexagons in this case, each row at a time. So I have my graph paper. I'll list a couple of links where you can download your own graph paper for hexagons if you want. Uh, but here, for example, you'll see I drew out what I'm going to do. So I was going to make it a little bigger and of course made it a little smaller. Um, I want to get it done sooner, not later. Um, here's another little, if you like to color, you can work through your um, your project and you can do it like that. So um, you can buy any of your paper pieces pre-cut. Um, one of the most popularly known places to get them is online at a company called paperpieces.com and of course there's lots of other resources for that. I personally cut my own hexagons. I have a die cutting machine as you know and so um, I, I have two dies, one that will cut the cardboard, the cardstock, and one that cuts the fabric to fit. Um, I didn't want to use the smaller hexagons, so I decided to just use the die that's meant to cut the fabric to cut the cardstock. And so they're a little bigger. I think it's one and a quarter inch. Uh, and so then what I do is I find out what square measurement will fit the hexagon and in this case it came out to three inches and so to get started I take my square of fabric and I place my hexagon within the square and then I start folding over and I put my little, these little clips on there to hold I've tried many ways. You try the ways you, you know. Find out what you like best. Isn't that what we do with everything we do in quilting or sewing? Um, I used to use a glue stick. I could still use them. But when all is said and done, in reality for me, 
I'd rather just hand base them with thread and not glue. And I don't need to cut out a hexagon shape, I can use a square. I don't care about this excess fabric. If when I get my quilt together I want to go back and trim it out, I can. I just don't really think it's an issue. And so there you go. Next I take my thread and I use um, a Milner's needle. It's a very thin needle. Uh, and the reason I use a thin needle is because the bigger the eye of the needle, as it goes through the fabric, the eye is going to, if it widens at the eye, it's going to pull the fabric away. And so I like to use a needle that the eye of the needle is almost the same size as the roundness of the needle, if that makes sense. And so these are um, number 10 Milner's. And what's really nice is they come 10 in a little tube. Um, you can get, you know, there's so many different brands out there. But I um, will get my tube of Milner's needles and I get my nifty little notion here. This is called a thread dome. I've had this one for so long, I, I notice it's getting yellowish on the plastic. <laughs> but that's okay, it still works. And so how the thread dome works is, I don't know about you, but as I'm stitching along, I, I just don't want to stop and re-thread my needle. I get on a roll and I just want to keep going. And so when I get started to do a project or when my needles uh, run out of thread, I sit there and I reload my thread dome, use my needle threader because that eye of the needle is real small. I use whatever thread that I feel like using. In this case I have a Masterpiece pre-wound bobbin. It's a 50 weight cotton, um, but I'm not a thread snob. If I had uh, a polyest polyester I would use it, it doesn't matter. So I load up, load up my thread dome by loading all 10 of my needles. And the way this works, it, it comes with directions, but the way it works is you thread a needle, you leave the tail of the thread, you put it in, you turn it, and the thread winds around. Then when you're ready to use them, I use mine in reverse order. So I loaded them 1 through 10, and then I un unload them, or I use them, 10, 9, 8 in the reverse order. So I'm going to pull out my thread. That's in number nine position. And you can see I, I could just really just pull it out. It comes out just fine. I can close that up. And I'm ready to stitch. Now I noticed that I left these a little longer than I probably should. And I'm getting a lot of tangles and knots. Um, so you could either use a thread conditioner or trim your thread back a little. And I honestly am going to trim my thread back. Um, I normally only use about 24 inches in length of thread for applique or whatever. So there we go. Now in this case, um, I don't need a tiny, need, uh, tiny knot. I just make a big old sewing knot. Now I'm going to start. I, I like to start. I don't know why, but I like to start here. I guess because it's just all one by itself. These clips are holding two corners down. And so I start here. I'll remove the binder clip. Take a little stitch. I take a second stitch and I'll put a little knot there. For whatever reason, if the thread breaks, over here, it's not it here. It's just not going to unravel. It's going to just unknot in that one place. So then I remove another clip. I come over to this corner, take my little stitch, and then I, I hold the thread, take another stitch, and put all that little knot in there. And then go over here and all the way around. Now there's um, a lot of advanced shapes, for lack of a better word, um, that you could use in paper piecing. The two that come to mind that I feel are more of an advanced English paper piecing would be the clamshell and the um, apple core. Because with those shapes, you cannot do straight sides together and stitch together. You actually have to do a form of applique on two sides. 
Um, so if there's any interest, I'll demonstrate that one in a future video. Uh, but I just want to get your, um, just get you introduced to, I know you know how to stitch hexagons. Um, so I just really wanted to show you uh, how to do it in a row by row process. So finishing up on that one. So I, I talked earlier about how I'm doing a block of the month with uh, Sue Spargo with the designer Jen Kingwell. And so this is my little warm up. Just when I need another project. But you can never have enough. And now I have my last one, the last little corner there that needs to be basted into to the cardboard cardstock. There's also other sh um, products you could use, like there are mylar plastic ones that you could use, and they have a little hole in them, and you can put a pin to hold the fabric in place, and so on. So there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. This is just the one that I choose to use. I felt like the mylar plastic, which I did start off with those a, long, a lot of years ago, they're too slippery for me, and the fabric just slips all over. Uh, and then they don't bend as easily. Uh, because as I get going on this, I'm going to have to bend my cardboard so that I can work it into the area it needs to be stitched. I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, let me show you a couple other little notions that I have over here. I have this little product called Lickety Grip. I was a bank teller a long, long time ago, worked in a grocery store, and you always needed something to give your uh, fingers a little moisture and a little snap so you can count the bills. Um, and I think they just took this product and said, hey, we can use that in sewing <laughs> because I love it. So that's lickety, lickety what? Lickety grip. Okay. Of course, I told you about the Milner's needles. Um, you get to get yourself a good needle threader because the smaller the eye of that needle, you are going to need a needle threader and not because of vision so much. The width of the thread, or the thickness of the thread, is hard to get through that little eye of the needle at times. So it really is to your advantage to have one of these clover, this is a clover one. What you want is one that has a very thin wire to pass through the eye of the needle. So this is why I always go to the notions wall wherever I go, because these babies don't last forever. Uh, you're constantly pulling on that wire, it eventually gives way or bends too much to be used again. And then, of course, they got these little clips. They're really great. And um, there you have it. Now, I showed you how I did my basting. Uh, I used, actually, the thread that I used my piecing for. But what you would really prefer to do is use uh, a contrasting color of your fabric so that if you want to re remove those basting threads after your project is done, you can see them easily. So you see here I used green to do all my, all my basting here. I may or may not go back. Quite frankly, I don't think I'll bother snipping those threads out because they're not causing any problems. Um, I don't think they're going to shadow through any of the light colors. I think it's just fine. And so here's what I have so far. And you can see, I'll pull out my little... By the way, I basted all these guys. They're ready to go. These go so quickly when you're basting. I usually do these while I'm watching TV with the kids. Um, you know, I can't quite stay isolated in the sewing room, but I want to do a little something towards my project. And so I find that this is the best thing to do. And get them all ready ahead of time. So if we go back to my, my graph, as I know that this is kind of, there we go. I started with the first row. This is my first row. And so the second row, you see I'm going to start hitting the colors for the flower. So over here, you see I have my stack. And this is the hexagons that are going to go in this row. So after this one is finished being attached to the row, I'm going to move on to stitch this one. And then I'm going to continue. And then I'm going to go up this way. I'll show you how I do my stitching. If it takes too long, I'll fast forward the video. Uh, by the way, this is a needle that is all empty and used up. 
I left that there so I could show you that when you're finished with your needle from your thread dome, you put it back in empty for when you're ready to reload later. I love this baby. It's awesome. All right, so I have, I do have a needle. Oh boy, it's a tiny needle. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna make sure my tail, and we do sew with a single thread. The reason I like the cardboard I mentioned a little earlier is that you're going to wind up bending and shaping so that you can get, it's going to be very hard to get into this. I'm going to sew this together next and I'm going to have to manipulate all the other pieces that are in that row and I want to focus on lining that up. Those sides of those two hexagons are the ones I'm going to stitch together next. As soon as I get my needle. My goodness, I'm having a hard time with my needle today. My goodness, there we go. And so I am going to do a whip stitch. And you know what a whip stitch is. Um, you could do a ladder stitch. It's just, it's not a rhythm for me that I like. So I go into the corner of both hexagons. And I pull it through. And just like hand piecing, I always knot my first end. If I ever need to rip out, I'll always have to just go back to my last knot. And that's going to make a big difference. And then you grab a little bite of fabric from the top of each hexagon. Need to see a little closer. There you go. then I continue. Some people will stitch towards them, some will stitch away. I stitch towards myself because I can see better. Um, and then there's a little bit of fuzz here from the other stitching. I'll move out of the way. So here's a couple of the downfalls. You don't want to go too deep in the fold and you don't want to go too close with your stitches. You're not a sewing machine. It doesn't have to be as close as your sewing machine stitches are if you were machine piecing. That, I think, is probably the biggest tip I could give you, is you do not need to make 700 little stitches here. I also have a habit of pulling my thread over and holding it with this finger, because I want to keep that tension on that spot. And of course, the tension won't stay there um, unless I hold that thread. Uh, so I, I developed the habit of just going over there and holding my thread with my finger there. And so you just work your way all the way to the end. And you want to make sure that your pieces stay in place. They sometimes shift. So I just make sure they are going to match at the end of that cardboard right there. Another thing you want to make sure of is don't stitch through your cardboard. That's another reason why I don't glue anymore. When I glue, when I use a temporary glue stick to glue my fabric to my cardstock, it's a really tight wrap over the edge. And it actually becomes more difficult to take just a little bite of fabric. And I found I was stitching into the cardboard very frequently when I was um, glue basting my fabric to the cardstock. So that's another thing that I learned for myself that I like. So I'm done with that. I'm almost to the end. I've got a stitch or two more to go. Oh, there we go. We're getting a little bit tangly. Some thread conditioner will help that. And I'm at my last stitch at the corner. Take one, then I'll take another with a knot. And that one's done. Now I'm going to leave the thread attached because I'll be able to just continue sewing. So I'm going to open out my piece. It's a little annoying to handle with the cardboard in it, but once you get your foundation row and then your next row, you'll be able to take out some of these cardboards. But until all of the sides are stitched, that's the rule. 
until all the sides of that hexagon or piece that you're using are stitched, you have to leave your cardboard in there. Once the cardboard, once the sides are all stitched, you no longer need the cardboard to hold the place. What will happen as this piece gets bigger, I will wind up leaving the one on the end, the cardboard on all the ends of the rows, my foundation row, and then my ending row. Because at the end, when all the middle is sewed, I will then do my edge. <clears throat> now there's many techniques you can do to finish off your edge. That's a whole nother story. Um, you can get the paper piece that will fit in there, which is my preference. Or you can stitch a hexagon part way and then cut it. But I don't see any point in doing that when you can easily cut the cardstock the shape you need it. Right? So, whoopsie, this is hard to... <laughs> there we go. So I would just cut, fold this in half, and that's the shape you need for the edge. So there's no need to waste your time sewing, basting it to the cardstock. And then that would just fit right in, right in here with a bit of a seam allowance. It's perfect. And then of course the other edge will be a little bit different because um, you're going to have to find a piece that will fit in for the corner, blah, blah, blah. Like I said, a whole nother story, but that's in finishing um, a hexagon quilt or a paper piece quilt. Um, that's really not a technique thing, that's just an approach, so you can research that yourself probably. So as far as my graph paper tells me, my part of my blue flower is the next piece that's going to get sewn into this row. And so I can choose to sew whatever side I want first. I like to have a little bit of a strategy that if I don't have to cut the thread, I'll sew this one first. Because if you remember, that's my thread left off at the end over here. So I, I mean, I could sew that side first because that's where the thread is. Either way, I'm going to eventually have to break the thread. So um, I'll go ahead and do that since we're on a time crunch. Now here's the thing, fold that other stuff out of your way. Just clear the field for where you need to sew. Okay, and so now I am ready and I will take that first stitch and knot it again because I do that at every one of them. I want to make sure my thread's not stuck anywhere. Okay, we're good. There's a lot of um, thread in the at the corners. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of layers to go through, because you figure it's folded over. So there's three or four layers here and three or four on the other side. So that first one, you need a little bit of a, you need to shove it through there quite a bit. Now, if you do go through the papers when you get ready to take everything apart, you'll gently um, peel that back. You don't want to tug it out of there and rip your stitches apart because uh, you'll have to redo them. I'm also, I also have my work like, I don't know, two feet away from my eyes, so it's a little, little tricky, but I want to get it close enough to the camera that y'all can see it, and keep going. And there you go. And there I have that piece attached. So of course the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to fold and manipulate all these pieces so that I can get in there and sew this next side. And that's how you do row by row. That's the row by row approach to doing your English paper piecing. Um, and this is handy if you're not making just hexagon flowers that you're going to attach together later. So you can make a lot of designs and sketch them out on your graph paper and then attach all your fabric each piece at a time until you get the design you want. With a really large quilt you would work in sections and then sew those sections together. Um, and there you go. I hope you enjoyed that and found some helpful information on how to do some English paper piecing. And I'll keep you posted on my English paper piecing blog of the month. It ships the first week of June. So I'm pretty excited about that. 
and I'll uh, show you some progress as I go. I'll be back next week to tell you all about my stitch week. Hopefully I'm going to have more progress to show you. And what I'm going to show you next week for my, de my demonstration, I'm going to show you how I got started with my um, Red Barn Ranch Block of the Month, Dancing Chickens, Flying Pigs. So I'll show you how I um, prep my fabric, how I um, mark my fabric for the design, how I cut my wool, because this is not die cut, so I have to go back to the old freezer paper. Um, and so I'll show you all about that. And I'll show you my threads, and I'll show you some fun. And then hopefully you'll say, isn't that nice, and move along. Or maybe it'll inspire you to try some hand applique. But till next time, have a great stitch week. I'll see you back here. And uh, this is number three in the series of about six or seven, so our time is short. But I enjoy every minute of it.